So, welcome again to Baden Baden for the uh, recap of the penultimate round of the Cranky Chess Classic 2019. Uh, another nice round for all of us. A uh, couple of draws, a couple of decided, decided games. Let's start with Aronian against Anand. What can you tell me about it? Jan Gustafsson. Yeah, not much. Both guys clearly not happy. Vichy having lost his last two games and Aronian losing the game going into this one. So I think it was a bit of damage control by both sides. I played this Berlin and there was some interesting maneuvering early on, but then the position simplified reasonably quickly and they both got to lick their wounds, go home with the draw and hopefully be recovered for this last round today. Yeah, so. Longest game of the day, Vallejo against Neidic, also ended in a draw. What do we say about that one? <clears throat> yeah, there was a confusing game, some opening subtleties, and I thought early on Vallejo got a very good position when Neidisch played this d5 and had a passive bishop on b7, but then quickly things turned. I'm not sure Vallejo played a bit too ambitiously, but at some point he played some move knight g4, hurting his own pawn structure. Then I thought he was fighting for a draw, struggling to stay in the game, and it looked like it was an end game where Neidisch had pressure, but in time trouble, things got a little out of hand, and... Vallejo took over the initiative again, could have won, I believe, on move 40 exactly by playing g4, but he struggled as often with the clock and did not find that later on. He was two pawns up with two pawns and a rook and a knight versus just a rook and a bishop, but it was difficult to win because there's always the potential of the bishop sacrificing itself for these two pawns. So I'm not 100% sure if it was always drawn theoretically, but Vallejo did not manage to convert tough defense by Nardic and draw. Then let's go to one of the decisive games. Uh, Vajela Graf won against uh, Vincent Keimer, as expected. Well, of course, Maxim is the number five in the world. Of course, he's a favorite against the German I am with 2,500. But Vincent has scored two out of three going into that game and has been playing very good chess, so it's not a given, and you could see Maxim showing him respect by playing the Alapin Sicilian, trying to avoid the theoretical debate. I wouldn't say his opening was a great success, actually it looked like White had to fight for equality at some point around move 15 after both sides developed. Then Vincent took a very ambitious decision with b5, trying to break up the white pawn structure early on, which Maxim was very critical of. And um, because it allowed him to launch an attack on the king, there were quieter options like rook f to d8, when black seemed to be doing all right as well. So in the game, Maxim had an attack against which Vincent defended well, but he had to weaken his king's position a bit with f5, and that gave the French world-class player enough to work with to coordinate his pieces, create some threats. Then computer-wise, the position was still equal in the time trouble. Vincent missed some chances, but it felt like Vashila Grav was taking over. And then later on, yeah he converted by doing some expert calculations, as he does. Let's go to the game Maya Caruana. He Caruana won, gives a very slight chance of a tie break perhaps today. What do you say about that game? He won with the black pieces? Yeah. He's been a tough opponent for Maya, I think, had a 5-1 score going into that game. And he's adapted Magnus Carlsen's opening from the World Championship, the Sveshnikov. They played this line with three bishop b5, the Rosolimo. Karana sacrificed the pawn for long-term compensation early on. Very interesting idea with his knight to e6, c takes b, a takes b. And then the position was highly complex, but it felt maybe a bit easier to play for black. And Maya got under some pressure. There was one key moment where Maya could have sacrificed a rook around like move 28. Rook takes g6. And according to the computer, very surprisingly, it would have given him a winning position. Karana had seen that line, but it's so hard to believe, if you look it up over the board, that Y is actually winning there, because I think he just gets two pawns for a rook and a long-term attack, but the computer said that was winning. But after, yeah, that didn't happen in the game, Karana just increased the pressure and very methodically broke through at some point with c5 to c4 and won a nice game. Yeah. Nice game, that's a nice, that's a, the right word for the next game. Swidler against Carson. Maybe nice game is not good enough. So, so, call it a brilliancy by Carson with the black pieces against such a strong player. With no disrespect meant to Carlsen, I don't think the players would necessarily call it a brilliancy because it's the story of Swidler missing a key move 
out of the opening, we'll have a look at that. It was another of these C5 Knight C6 Sicilians that Carlson has been playing regularly. Svidler played a very solid line with this three knight to C3, and after E5 we get this locked position where white has control of the D5 square, but black has good pieces and good piece play around it, so Carlson seems to be not too worried about that structure. And then he managed to actually wrestle control of the D5 square away from Svidler, and that's the position we'll see on the board where things took a dramatic turn. So here we are. It's white to move, and Svidler in this, decision, in this position decided that he has to do something before black stabilizes further with a move like queen to d6 and rook coming to f8 because black already has central control. So Svidler tried to break up the structure and he found a very interesting idea. He played the move pawn to f4, typical. The problem is after e takes f4 that white cannot recapture with his rook because if he were to take, the knight would jump to e5, the queen has to move, then black takes on f4 and in the end there is a fork on d3. So of course the players didn't miss that, but Swidler's point was after f4, e takes f4, he wants to go queen to g5, controlling this e5 square and hitting the d5 pawn, while now threatening to take on f4. And Swidler had mainly calculated, I guess, the move d5 to d4 here, after which it seems like white is okay after rook takes f4, but Carlsen had a great move here that changed the nature of the game. And it is a quiet little move, queen to f8, which doesn't look like anything special defending the f4 pawn. But the more important point is that after bishop takes d5, now black has to move rook to f5, winning the bishop because of the double attack. So white cannot take on d5 with the bishop, has to take with the queen. But after this, the black pieces just coordinate much, much better. Rook to d8 comes with tempo, and we will see in the game that now all the black pieces are coming, the black pawns are rolling on the, on the king side, and it's very hard for white, at least in a practical game, to hold this position. Like the computer still shows that after queen to g5 or queen to h5, sacrificing this pawn, white has good chances for survival, but over the board, I do believe this was an uphill battle already. Swidler went for queen to f3, but now the knight also joins the battle, knight to e5. He had to go queen to e4, because after, I can show this, queen to e2, Knight takes d3, rook cd1, black has a nice little tactical shot in form of c5, c4, and you cannot take this pawn because then there's a queen c5 check, picking up the bishop, so that was impossible. And after queen to e4, Carlsen managed to establish this powerful knight on e3, controlling the situation, and even though Svidler could probably put, have put, put up more resistance with this knight on e3, he was fighting for a lost cause and Carlsen managed to convert in very good style. So yeah, another very impressive victory for Magnus Carlsen, but I don't think Peter Svidler will be too thrilled about this game.